Thank you for being here this morning as we worship the Lord together. I just got to say, it works out really well this morning as we're getting back into uh, Ephesians. We took a short break last week with the ladies at the retreat. We're back into Ephesians chapter 1, and uh, we're talking about redemption, and yet we had communion this morning. It's just neat how God works that out because we do communion uh, typically first Sunday of the month, and I didn't plan that, but I believe it fits extremely well. It's going to be remembering what Christ has done for us in the in the shedding of his blood for us, so, and what that all means. Let's begin by opening a word of prayer. Father God, we are so thankful to be here this morning, be a part of the work that you're doing. Uh, we thank you for this church. Lord, we just entrust it to you, that uh, you would be glorified, and that you would be the one doing the, the work and the ministry that you, you want here, and that we would just be yielded to you, servants of yours, being obedient to your word. Lord, we thank you that we can do that because of the your saving grace and because of the work of your spirit in our lives. We just thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a story about a missionary who went to West Africa and he was trying to uh, convey the meaning of redeem or redemption, the word redeem, in the the, the native language, the, the Bambara language. So he asked one of uh, the natives there who was, who was an assistant of his, you know, what, there, it seems as though your language has no actual word for redeem. How do, you, how do you relay this? How do you describe what this word redeem means? And he said to him, he says, we understand it as this, that God took our heads out. And so he was a little confused by that, like, how does that uh, explain what the word redeem means? And so he told them the backstory to it, about how in their past, that when men would be taken into slavery, they were being, being taken by slave traders and uh, sadly shipped to places like America back in those days, and uh, they would put these iron rings around their necks and chain them together, and then that's how they would keep them chained and lead them around, and they would have to lead them through the country to get them to the coast, and as they're passing through the country, they would pass through different villages, and sometimes one of the, or the chief in one of the villages would recognize one of the men that is being enslaved as a friend or, or something to that, that degree and would pay the price in gold or silver or, or whatever uh, they had to be able to pay. and would pay the price to buy them out of slavery and they would take their heads out of the chains or out of the iron rings. And so and that's why he said that God took our heads out. We're going to look at redemption this morning. What does redemption mean? Uh, how did God redeem us? Why are we redeemed? Why is this so important as Christians? If you're sitting out there this morning and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're probably going, yeah, I understand all of this already. But hopefully we can take a look at Ephesians here, take a look at some other scripture to help bring this all together. And I hope you leave this morning with a richer view of redemption and what God has done for us. We're in Ephesians. We only started just a few weeks ago. We're working our way through. We're, only, we're still in chapter 1. We're only a few verses in. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 10 of Ephesians chapter 1. So turn there with me if you're not already there, please, so you can be following along. For those of you who are new, um, I preach out of the NASB version, so if that's helpful to know. Sometimes it's a little bit different in how they're translated from, from one translation to the other. Before we even get started in this verse, we need to remember something, though. If you remember back up in verse 3, in how Paul has introduced this letter to the church at Ephesus, uh, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly excuse me in the heavenly places in Christ God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ so this is just incredible 
But what does that look like? And that's really what Paul does next. And now he goes in and he starts describing how we are blessed by God in, in some of the most important ways. And we get to verse 7 and we start to see the idea of redemption. And incidentally, we can carry these, uh, this, uh, these blessings, I believe that Paul's talking, at least through verse 14. Uh, and, and then he starts to change gears a little bit from there. But really what we're doing here is, is we're kind of, he's building on what he just said in verse 3. What are these blessings? What do they look like? So when we get to verse 7, he says, in him we have redemption. Redemption. Now, there's a lot of different ways to try to understand what redemption means, what the word redemption means, what it means in the Bible, what it means for us as Christians. There's different analogies we can use. I'm going to look at a little bit of that. But I think the one that we're going to find, that you'd find if you study out Scripture, is being redeemed or purchased out of slavery. Now, Thankfully, we do not live in a country that has the issue of slavery going on in it anymore, uh, at least legally. And so, but we got to remember the culture that the Bible is written in. The entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, there was slavery. Uh, slavery was, I, I could spend a long time on slavery, and I'm not going to, but you can imagine yourself, if you were in slavery owned by someone else, no longer free, forced to labor, and, and, and typical slavery was not pleasant. Now, the Bible instructed believers, if you're going to have slaves, how you treat them and regard them the way that you're supposed to. And there can be different reasons throughout Scripture why a person was in slavery. Not all of them were bad reasons. Uh, slavery in general, I believe, is not necessarily a good thing. Obviously, but, but the, the way the Bible teaches on it helps us understand this idea of redemption. Because you imagine being in slavery and someone buying you out of that slavery. What are we enslaved to, though? Well, we're in, before Christ, before salvation, we're enslaved to sin. That, that, that issue goes back to the beginning. God created the world. He created it good, perfect, without flaw. Adam and Eve were per perfect and complete without sin. But God did not create robots. And He gave Adam and Eve the option to choose. And He gave one thing for them not to do. And that was to eat the fruit from the tree they were not supposed to eat from. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what did they do? Well, we know how the story ends, right? They ate, they, they ate it, disobeyed God. As a result of that, the whole world has changed. The whole world has changed. And incidentally, I believe if any one of us were there, we would have done the same thing. Uh, and that's why it took Jesus to, to redeem us. We're, we're going to get into that. So, because of that, because Adam and Eve sinned, we have a sin nature... But that doesn't force us to sin. We sin on our own behalf. We, we sin because we choose to sin. And because we choose to sin, and that is to disobey God, we are enslaved to sin. Enslaved to sin. But God knew we needed to be redeemed from that. Otherwise, we're going to, we would face the penalty of sin. We'll get into that in just a little bit here. Into what the penalty of sin is. Uh, but God knew that we needed to be able to be saved from that slavery because we weren't going anywhere. We had, we had iron rings around our neck and we were chained to sin. And, and the consequences of that sin is, is big and it is, e, it is uh, definite and eternal. So, when we look at this idea of redeemed, and the next thing we're going to look at in this verse, and incidentally, uh, I'm going to probably spend most of my time in, in verse 7 here. Um, so if you feel like I'm going slow, I'm doing it intentionally. Uh, what are, how, how, are we for, how are we redeemed? Well, we see here through His blood. Talking about Jesus, we are redeemed through His blood. I'll talk about more about what that means here in just a moment. But why, let, me, let me ask you just a question for you to ponder. Why did God go to such great extents? I mean, couldn't he have just said, you're forgiven? I mean, why did Jesus have to come and do all that he did so that we could be redeemed? Why didn't he just 
offer forgiveness. Wouldn't that seem like it'd be much easier? Well, I don't believe biblically understanding this that that's impossible. Let me give you uh, some reasons why as we sort of build this understanding of redemption and the purpose of it. So you have to remember, we don't just sin. We sin against someone and against someone's perfect law. And that is God. God is holy and perfect. He is completely without sin. And therefore, He has holy, perfect standards. We sin against those standards. We break God's law. We we disobey and sin against a perfect, holy God. And He is also a just God. And justice must be served. One way to think about this is... Maybe some of you kids, uh, this might be a little over your heads, and I know we got a lot of kids out there this morning, uh, but adults will certainly understand the, the issue of debt and the, the idea of debt or loan forgiveness. Uh, maybe you've heard about some of it on the news recently and years past. There's always been these things of, of debt forgiveness, loan forgiveness going on. So how does loan forgiveness work? Just oh, you know what, no big deal, let's pretend it never happened. Well, to the person in debt that gets it, oh, maybe that sounds like it, it's that way to them, but the reality is, is that debt has to be paid. Either you're going to pay it and pay it back, which I believe would be the right thing to do, is to pay it back, or the loan company, the company that loaned the money, they have to absorb that money. So in a sense, they're paying it if you don't pay it. So one way or another, and you think about that analogy, the the debt has to be paid back. Same thing when we sin against a holy God. It's not just a matter of forgiveness, like no big deal, we just let it go away. The debt has to be paid. It has to be paid back. And the issue that we're going to find is we're unwilling to pay that back. Unwilling, excuse me. We're unable, that's what I was meaning to say, we're unable to pay that debt back. The debt is too high. So someone else has to pay it. And see, God is in the forgiveness, in the business. My mouth gets ahead of my mind sometimes. God is in the business of forgiving. And He wants to forgive. It is easy to fall into sin. It is not easy to to make that sin right. God understands that. He knows that. And he wants to make it right. This is the heart of God. Psalm 86, 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Abundant in loving kindness. He is eager and ready and willing to forgive. So this is the heart of God. But justice must be served. Somehow the penalty of sin must be paid. Because God is just, but He is also merciful. He's also gracious. So how do we take all these attributes of God that some of them seem to be in opposition to one another, how do they work and fit together perfectly? Because the character of God is not in opposition to itself. So how can God be just and also be merciful and gracious at the same time? Well, the penalty for sin gets paid, and through that, God offers redemption. So that next part there in verse 7, through His blood, is how it is done. It is through the blood of Jesus. The the blood here we understand as through the death of Jesus, through the giving of his life. Why death? Because that was the penalty for sin. Do you remember in the garden what God warned Adam? He says, but from the this is Genesis 2:17, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Death. That's the penalty for sin. What kind of death are we talking about? Well, I think, I think we can narrow it down to three different kinds of death that this was talking about. Physical death. Did Adam and Eve die immediately? No, they didn't die immediately. In fact, Adam lived 930 years old. That's a long time. But he did die. And you can get that out of Genesis 5, 5 chapter, chapter 5, verse 5. 
The Bible promises death. Boy, there's a word of encouragement. And in as much as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. After this comes judgment. You know, we gotta be, we're going to be judged too. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, now I'm not talking about the Bema seat, but our judgment is going to go through Christ. In fact, Christ has already taken the judgment for us. The penalty has been paid through His death. Okay, so we're talking about kinds of deaths. Yes, physical death, but also spiritual death. Ephesians 2, we're going to get to that in a little, little while here, or not today, in weeks to come. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. We are dead before we are saved. Spiritually speaking, we are dead. And we are destined for physical death, and we are destined for eternal death. And that's the other death that I think that we need to talk about. Revelation chapter 20 talks about what a person that doesn't know the Lord has to look forward to. Verses 14 through 15, Revelation chapter 20, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, that is those who have trusted in Christ for salvation, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death, and that is eternal death. No more second chances after that point. We, we, have, we get our second chance here. We blew it when, when we sinned to begin with, and, and God has given us a second chance through his son Jesus, and he paid it with his life. Through his blood. The only way, if the penalty for sin is death, then the, the only way to pay for that is death. Either, either our death, which would be physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death, and that's the real one we got to worry about, is the eternal death, then Christ paid for it with His life so that we could be forgiven from our sins. God poured out His wrath on Jesus on the cross, uh, you can. We, I hope you remember that if you were here when we were going through the gospel according to Luke, that we, we saw that firsthand. As Jesus is on the cross, we see the anguish there in the garden before He ever even goes to the cross, and we see what God does while He is on the cross, and He is taking upon Himself the wrath of God, the punishment for all sin, taking upon Himself the sin of the world, so that all who would believe in Him would be able to have, be forgiven of their sin and have eternal life. And Jesus did that for us. In Him we have redemption through His blood. The other thing that we need to, I think, try to remember about this is understanding the Old Testament sacrificial system, which was a temporary way of dealing with the issue of sin. And it was through the death of animals. And Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, which is why we no longer need to, to uh, upkeep, keep up the law and the sacrificial system like that anymore. Christ completed the law uh, by dying on the cross, and, and we live in a new time. We don't need to do that. All of it is paid for through Christ. But if we look back to the Old Testament... Uh, you got, if you were here in Sunday school this morning, you got a bit of a history lesson on the establishing of the nation of Israel. God establishing the nation of Israel. And if you remember, and I don't think he talked about this this morning that I recall, but if, if you remember from God's word that while the Israelites were in Egypt, God used Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. But Pharaoh wasn't going to let them go right away. And so God allowed these plagues to happen to the Egyptians. You remember the final plague? That God was going to kill the firstborn people, animals, everything. The firstborn of everything. And the only way that the Israelites could escape it is by, by uh, taking a spotless, un spotless, unblemished lamb sacrificing it, taking its blood, and putting it in the doorway, on the doorpost and the lintel. And when God would come by that house, He would see that, 
And he would not take the firstborn of that house. And he would pass over. And that's where we get uh, Passover. And so we have the, the, the idea of death sacrifice with the Passover lamb. And I believe that was a foreshadow. It wasn't God mimicking that. That was to be a foreshadow of what Christ was going to do to be the ultimate Passover lamb and shed his blood as the lamb did so that when God would come to you to judge you and go, oh, am I going to bring eternal death to this person or not? No, because the blood of the Lamb of God, that is Jesus, has been shed and that person has, has received that, what Jesus has done for them, and God will pass over them. So hopefully you see the idea there from the Old Testament sacrifice to what Jesus did and helps us understand what exactly Jesus did for us and why he did it. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. For the forgiveness of our sin. Christ died on the cross. He shed his blood for us. God sent his only son, God in the flesh, to come live as a person from a baby born into this world to, to some 30 years old and did three years of ministry, making himself known as the Messiah. And, and dying on the cross for our sins, conquering death because he was such a, he was the perfect sacrifice, something we couldn't do, something we couldn't fix for ourselves because we are sinful and the only way for us to pay the penalty is for us to have eternal death. Christ could take it upon himself as a perfect man and defeat that death and raise to life from the grave uh, on the third day. And so, that's what Jesus has done for us. And by trusting in Him, we can have the forgiveness of our trespasses, or the forgiveness of our sin. And then the last part there, according to the riches of His grace. Again, God is eager to forgive, and His grace is rich, and He's offering it to all who will place their trust in Him, to the whosoever. We see that heart again. I just want to read again Psalm 86, 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Have you called upon the Lord? Even as Christians, yes, once saved, always saved. But we need to continue to call upon the Lord, to continue to be in a right relationship with Him. And He is eager to forgive even then as well. <clears throat> Verse 8, which He lavished on us. So according to the riches of His grace, think of how rich God's grace is, what He's offered us, what He's given to us, which He lavished on us. Now kids, maybe you're sitting out there this morning and you can think about a time when you feel like someone lavished a gift or gifts on you. Maybe it was Christmas or it was on a birthday or some other time where someone lavished you. They just poured out above and beyond more than you deserve and you were just in, almost in awe about what that person had given you, whether your parents or, or grandparent or someone else. And you, that, I think, is a good idea of lavished. But think of God's grace and how much more God's grace is than, than even anything material on this earth. Anything that we can possess tangibly on this earth, God's grace is so much more. And yet He has lavished it on us. He has poured it out in such amazing abundance, so much more than we deserve. And that's what He's done for us according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Now, if you uh, depending on the translation you're out there with this morning, the NASB puts a period at the end of the phrase, which He lavished on us, making it sound as though uh, in all wisdom and insight, that it's a separate, we're going into a separate thought. I do not believe we're going into a separate thought here. I believe the thought is building. And as Paul is writing this, he's, he's building upon one thing and then upon another and upon another. So when you, you read through this, you've got to just let it build and let it build. 
which He lavished on us. You can just take the period right out of there. Which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to... He's just building and building as we go. So He's lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us. You can really run those together in all wisdom and insight. Insight being understanding. So as, as He has done these things for us, He's not just left us in the dark, not understanding Him. See, it's extremely important that we understand what it is Christ has done upon the cross and what He's done for us. We need to know this. And, and God has revealed that to us through His Word. Jesus came and he, 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 the plan played out just as God intended it to. Uh, men witnessed it. They wrote it down. Then we have the four Gospels. We have the establishing of the church, the book of Acts. We see that played out. And then we, we have God using men like Paul and Peter and John and Jude and James to write the New Testament. And He has poured out on us knowledge and understanding about all the things God has done. And we have books, letters like Paul wrote to the, to the Ephesians that bring help us understand this idea of redemption, help us understand what God has done, what He's done for us, what this means for us. In all wisdom and insight or understanding, He made known to us. God wants to make Himself known to us. This is a theme that we see throughout the entire Bible. I love this verse in Ezekiel 38.23. He says, I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. God is in the business of forgiving, and He wants to make Himself known to all people. People have to know who the one true God is in order to understand how they can be forgiven and to be able to accept that gift of salvation for the forgiveness of sins. And God, from Old Testament all the way till today, has been making Himself known to all people. Even to the nation of Israel. And you're like, wow, God was really isolated to the nation of Israel. And He chose them to be His people. And, and yes, there's some truth to that. But really, one of the things that God was doing with the nation of Israel was using them to make Himself known to the other nations. And, and God is still doing that today. Uh, he's making Himself known to all nations. And, and when we get to the New Testament, now we have the Gospel being proclaimed to the entire world. And, and yes, it has made it all the way here to North Idaho. If you haven't noticed, we don't live in Israel. We're not Israelites. So here we are, Gentiles, and it has made it all the way to us. What an incredible thing. I think God has kept His promise here. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us. And then this next part phrase here, He says, the mystery of His will. The mystery of His will. God's will was a mystery. What does He mean by this? Yeah, to an extent, yes. I think God always made known His his willingness to forgive and that by believing in Him and that He was, even in Old Testament times, looking forward to that God was going to send a Redeemer. I think a lot of Old Testament people, they, they b believed that and understood that, but they didn't know what that was going to look like exactly. As you get further and further through the Old Testament, particularly in the writings of the prophets, it starts to unfold more. We start to understand more and more uh, about what this, who this Messiah Messiah was going to be, how he was going to do it, that he was going to be uh, going to redeem sins. But uh, even at that, it was a little bit confusing in the New Testament. You, 
even the disciples were confused about exactly what that looked like. They, you know, even Jesus' 12, uh, at least the 11, understood and knew that Jesus was the Messiah and had accepted that. But even in the end, when Jesus was ready to leave, they're like, so, so is now the time that you're going to establish? Because they're thinking, they're thinking when God is going to establish his, his kingdom, and we understand that now is the millennial reign of Christ, which is yet to come. Uh, Christ returns again. Uh, but there was even some confusion about exactly who, who the Messiah would be, what he would do, even through the Old Testament. Uh, even Hebrews 10.1 uh, kind of alludes to this. It says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things. The, the, the Old Testament was just kind of, it was pointing to what was going to happen in the New Testament, when Christ came. Uh, and we can look back now, and we can see it's clear, we understand it, and, but it was a bit of a mystery. But it did not remain a mystery, and I think it's important to understand that. That God did not intend to keep it a mystery, and that's what, exactly what Paul is saying here. He made known to us the mystery of His will. The mystery of His will. He made known. He sent Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins. He, he completely revealed everything in the Old Testament that needed to come true for that time. And, and some of it's still yet to come true. And He revealed it to us. He made it known to us, this mystery according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. Again, it was God's kind intention that he did all of this for us and that he has made it known to us so that we can understand it and therefore we can believe it. Because we must understand it before we can believe it. According to his kind intention which he purposed in him or he planned the word purpose there, in Christ. There's some different uh, interpretations of this, but I think Paul, in talking about Christ, he's pointing to Christ. He purposed, he planned it in Christ. Uh, it, incidentally, the plan of salvation, Jesus coming, this plan predates creation. How do I know that? Because God is omniscient. He is completely all-knowing. Uh, he's sovereign. He's in control. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, about how God's sovereignty and man's free will are able to work together because God is so perfect and so big. Uh, but he knew how this was all going to go, and he, from the beginning he planned it all out how Jesus would come and, and bring about redemption through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. <clears throat> And then we get to verse 10. With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the, of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things on the heavens and things on the earth. In Him. We're actually going to, I think that fits better with verse 11, that last little phrase of in Him. I know Steve was confused with that. That's okay. <laughs> with a view to an administration. Now, this isn't really terminology that we use like this, uh, I would say, too much uh, in our uh, vernacular, at least around here. Uh, and sometimes it's good to look at other translations. I know when I study, uh, I study in the original Greek and, or Hebrew, if we're in Hebrew, and I, I also look at other translations and see how they explain things. Sometimes that helps bring a little more light to what's trying to be said. Uh, the, the King James, the New King James, used the word dispensation. That's probably not any less confusing for a lot of you. Uh, ESV uses the word plan. God's plan NIV uh, puts it in a phrase and it says, to be put into effect. And the New Living, uh, which I don't know that I would necessarily call it a translation, it's, it's kind of a thought for thought, almost a, uh, a, a paraphrase, and, but I think it's good for, for extra study purposes. So the New Living Translation puts it like this, and this is the plan. I think that puts it in really plain English. English. This is the plan. 
So with a view to an administration, or think of it like this, with a view to a plan, God's plan, this is the plan suitable to the fullness of time. Suitable to the fullness of time. In other words, a plan for redemption that works perfectly with His timing, with God's timing. God created this plan, and we know that Jesus came at the fullness of time, at the perfect time. God's Word tells us that. God created this plan. It started with Jesus coming. He died on the cross, and that plan is is still in effect today. God is still in the business of saving people, forgiving people, those who have placed their trust in Him for salvation, and God's plan is still being played out. That is why you are all sitting out here this morning. That's why you came to church, and that's why you took communion, to remember what God has done, what His plan has done, that is sending Jesus to the cross to shed His own blood, to be the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb for us once for all. And if we have placed our trust in Him uh, by faith, we are forgiven. If it was a true, genuine belief in God for the forgiveness of sin, for salvation, we are forgiven. And God's plan is still being played out today, and it is still going to be played out in the future. Look at the rest of the verse. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, and things on the earth. Everything is coming to a concluding point. We're not there yet. We could be, we could be really close to the start of, of the actual end times events, but we're not there yet. And, but God's plan is playing out, summing everything up to this point of conclusion so that God's people will be with Him in all of eternity. The issue of sin, completely, it's, it's been dealt with, but completely done away with, and we get to live with our God and He gets to be our God. And that's the, the, the summing up of all things that we're looking forward to. I want to give you a taste of that. Turn to Revelation 21. I know I've quoted this, read this passage a few times uh, over the last few years, but it's just one of those ones that I think we really need to just keep fresh on our minds. And this is really, I believe, the summing up of, in the end, that that Paul is trying to talk about here. Revelation 21. Look at the first seven verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And incidentally, this is after, after the judgment has been taken care of. And it is just believers, true believers, with Christ, with God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning, or crying, or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his people, and he will be my son. This is what an incredible thing we have to look forward to. Now keep in mind that the only reason this is even possible is because of what Christ did for us. Because He paid the penalty. He took the cost of sin upon Himself. He paid it in full. God has taken out all of His wrath on Him so that those who trust in Him can have salvation. And what does salvation look like? In the end, it looks like this. We get to be with our God for all of eternity. And I don't know about you. I know, I know, actually I do know about you. I'm looking forward to it, and I know you are too. 
what an incredible thing we have to look forward to. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this truth about what God has done for us? Well, should we should rejoice. We should be the most grateful people on the planet. We should want to be obedient to Him. What, what else do we do with this, though? Uh, there's an application I want to take this to. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 17. Paul speaks some incredible truths here that go well with this text, but then there's something that he says in here that I kind of want to hone in on just a little bit. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new, cre new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. We are no longer the person we used to be. We are a new creation, a new creature, a new person given a new heart. Now all, verse 18, now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not continuing their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He knew the problem. He saw the problem. And he made a plan to resolve that problem. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As God, excuse me, as though God were making an appeal through us. Now this is Paul speaking about himself and those with him. Paul uh, mentions Timothy at the beginning of 2 Corinthians. Maybe he's referring to Timothy. Others, the, the other apostles that are in the same ministry that he's in. He's referring to himself. Therefore we, and incidentally, this should reflect back on us, we should fall into these shoes as well. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Because of what God has done, the plan that He has put in place, we are to be ambassadors for Christ. Those who are sent out to go out and share the good news. As though God were making an appeal through us. You know, God doesn't need to use people, but He chooses to use people to carry out His will on this earth uh, in, in, in many ways. And He wants to utilize us. We are His. He has called us friends of God. In other words, we are coming alongside Him uh, as friends alongside a king to, to go out and carry out the king's business and the king's will. We are called to do that. And we are sent out as ambassadors. Go out into all the world and share the gospel as he commissioned his disciples and, and also commissioned us to be doing. And Paul is doing that. And he's saying that's what we are. That's what we're doing. We should be identifying with this as well. To go out to wherever God has sent us, even if it's not far beyond these walls, to share the good news of Christ and, and to disciple people and, and to share the gospel with them and tell them about the love of Christ. And beyond that, wherever God sends you, uh, if it's in school or if it's at uh, your work or God sends you to the next county or sends you to the next state or the next country, wherever it is that God sends you, we are to be ambassadors for Him. And the last part of that, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This is the message that we come to people with. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you know what Christ has done for you? Do you fully understand it and why he did it the way he did it and that it was necessary the way that he went to the cross and died for us so that penalty of sin could be paid? Do you embrace that? Are you grateful? Do you, do you live a life of loving obedience for your God as a result of his saving you? And then what do you do with it from there? We, be, we are to be sent out to be ambassadors, go out and make disciples. 
and go out and share God's mystery, which is no longer a mystery, it's fully revealed in Scripture, to go out and share that mystery with others so it will no longer be a mystery to them. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you that you've revealed your mystery to us. I thank you that you have made known to us all that you've done. Your word is, is so abundantly clear how salvation works. And uh, Lord, I just pray that we would embrace it as believers and to take that, that message that is so real to us and has changed our lives to go out and share it with others and be ambassadors of yours and help others grow in that truth and in your love. We thank you that you help us in understanding these things. We have the, the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives to enable us to understand your word and share it with others. We thank you for that. Just pray that we would take this to heart seriously. I just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.